we started a series on the faith, examining the essentials, taking a real step back and looking, what is it that makes Christianity distinct? What, what should we believe? Why do we believe what we believe? And so the direction that we're taking this entire series is what I believe all of Scripture hinges on, the one God. And so last week, we talked about how when we come to faith, it's not enough just to believe. Even the demons believe and they shudder. But we have to believe the right thing about the right one. And so this is the background of the Jewish faith, which Christianity sprung from. The Jews were monotheists, monotheism, worshipers of one God. And then, uh uh-oh, when Jesus showed up, that was a problem. Jesus claims to be one with God. Well, that kind of upset the apple cart of their perspectives. And sometimes we find that our personal beliefs can kind of sway our understandings of what is true. It can, it can influence what we believe to be true. There was a man, a farmer, and he had a son, and his son had a very unique condition. And as time went on, it, it became clear to this farmer that his son wasn't getting any better. So, so after some time, he made an appointment, and he took his son to a psychiatrist. And as the doctor uh, sat down with them, he said, so what seems to be the problem here? Uh, Well, sir, uh, my son believes he's a chicken. And the psychiatrist said, okay, okay. Uh, And when exactly did this problem present itself? The farmer hangs his head and he says, six years ago, sir. Psychiatrist says, "Six, six years ago? Six years ago? Why are you just bringing him to me now? With his head still hung, the the farmer said, well, well, frankly, doctor, we needed the eggs. (laughs) We're going to be in John 8 this morning. And we're going to be reading about the difficulty of people's perspectives and how it Uh, confronts Jesus. For our first passage, we're going to be in John 8. We're going to start in verse 56 and go through 59. Now, up to this point, leading up to our passage, Jesus is talking with the people, and the Pharisees really start laying into him. Jesus starts saying some pretty radical things, okay? He says, I'm not of this world. He says, He's one with the Father. I'm doing the works that the Father has given me to do. This is what I am doing. And so the Pharisees get very tense with what Jesus is saying. I'm not okay with what Jesus is saying. And so they're laying into him. Okay, so starting in verse 56... Jesus says, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. Therefore they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Now, why would they want to stone Jesus? It wasn't because the Jews were necessarily fiery people or just like, ah, we're tired of speaking to you. Let's pick up stones and hit you with them. When Jesus said, before Abraham was born, I am, the Jewish mindset, even if you weren't a Pharisee or a religious leader, would have immediately gone back to Exodus 3.14 where Moses and God were conversing. And Moses said, 
who am I going to tell him is sending me when I go to Pharaoh with this? I, I'm just this guy. God says, tell them I am has sent you. I am. And so when Jesus said, before Abraham was born, I am, they knew what he was talking about. Now flip a couple more pages to your right, and we're going to be in John 14, reading verses 5 through 9. Now this is prior to Jesus' death on the cross. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How do we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been so long with you, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Again, Jesus was not ambiguous about who he was, who he believed himself to be. And so the problem is that Jesus was a problem for those who understood him. First, with the religious leaders in our first passage, they sought his death. Why? Because some people will say that they sought Jesus' death because they wanted to keep their power and their status. And so that's why they wanted him dead. Would the religious leaders oppose him pointing people to God? Would they oppose him doing good for the people? No. But in John 10, Jesus asks them, why are you picking up stones? Why do you want to kill me? Which one of these good things am I doing that you want to kill me for? And they said, we don't want to kill you for any good act, but because you, a mere man, claim to be God. They knew what he was saying. In the next passage that we read, the apostles struggled to understand Jesus' claims. They confessed him as Lord, and yet they still fell away. They called him Messiah, and yet they had no idea what that actually meant. See, the idea of the Messiah is scriptural. It is biblical, but it's often misunderstood. When you look at messianic passages, they don't say, by the by, everything that follows is going to be about the Messiah, or what you just read, that's about the Messiah. It doesn't work like that. And so when we come to the word of God, we have to be willing to ask ourselves a crucial question. Do I fully understand the fullness of God's saving acts? I'm a pastor standing up here, and I'll tell you right now, I don't. I don't understand the fullness of what God is doing in history, but I know that the fullness of God is in Christ. And so I can point people to Christ even when there's something that I don't understand. When someone's sitting at the bedside of their child dying of leukemia, I don't have an answer for that, but I know who does. I know who is the answer. See, Jews and Christians all have their different passages for the Messiah. But what does Jesus say in John 5? Jesus says that all of scripture points to him. He says, you search the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. But it's these that testify to me. These, as in all of the Jewish Bible, all of it points to Christ. Genesis to Malachi points 
to Christ. And then when we had our gospels and the Pauline and the letters from Peter and the other authors, they all point to Christ. So when did views of Jesus start to change? After the resurrection, the safest place to be is in him for protection, for, for correction, for perfection in Christ. Remember what Thomas said when he saw the risen Jesus? Oh, my Lord and my God. Pliny the Younger, he was a governor of Bithynia in Asia Minor in 112 AD. Now, just so you know, this is within a generation after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Much, much too less, uh, much too short a time for, for like, hey, let's make up something and put out and make Jesus out to be someone that he's not. Much too short a time for something like that to happen. And Pliny is writing a letter, and he says in this letter that these believers, these followers of Jesus, sang a hymn to Christ as to a God. He was not a believer. Now, I want to uh, bring up my volunteers here. If I talked to you before the service and asked you if you wanted to come up here and help, go ahead and please uh, come forward here. And as you come forward, uh, go ahead and come over here and stand to my left. As you do that, I'm going to give you something. Uh, You may or may not remember, but last week I, I asked you, I challenged you to memorize the Ten Commandments. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give each of you a picture. Please do not show it right now, and we're going to go through, and we're going to see who remembers their Ten Commandments, okay? So we'll start with, uh, oh, there you go. So we'll start with the first commandment. Who remembers the first commandment from Exodus, from Exodus 20? And Deuteronomy 5. What's the first commandment? You shall have no other gods before me. Okay? And when we say them, go ahead and bring them forward. They should all be in order. Bring them forward and go ahead and place them on the cross. And then go stand over there to the right of the cross. So the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before before me. Now, uh, I forgot to say, I was thinking about bringing them up here and saying, okay, now what we're going to do, we're going to be talking about sin, so I'm going to bring these people up here, and we're going to ask them what their secret sin is, but (laughs) we're not going to do that. (laughs) Turn around. You're showing it. Turn around. Are you kidding me? It is so hard to find good help these days. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. (laughs) So what is the second commandment? You shall have no other gods before me. No, not yet. Not yet. Do not make, do not make an idol to worship or serve. Do not make an idol to worship or serve. That basically means exalting anything over God. Third commandment. Do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. What about commandment four? Oh. There you go. (laughs) Commandment four. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Yep. So next person. 
Okay. What about commandment five? Uh, honor your father and your mother. Yeah, father's in there too. Sorry, Robin. <laughs> honor your father and your mother. What about the sixth commandment? Do we know it? You shall not murder. Do not murder. Not a good thing. Don't do it. Now, it's interesting because for this one, Jesus actually raised the bar. He was trying to bring to mind what these commandments actually mean. What does it mean to exalt God overall? There's no other God. No idols. Don't take the name of the Lord in vain. Well, he said that if you even look at your brother, if you, if you curse them, if you hate them in your heart, it's like you've already committed murder against them. What about the seventh commandment? Do not commit adultery. Yeah. So go ahead in that next one. And this is interesting because this is another one that Jesus addressed. He said, if you even look with another person, if you even look at another person with lust for them, it's like you've committed adultery with them in your heart. So what Jesus was saying that the sin life is not just the act. It's your desire. It's what's in your heart. So everything, everything from the thought to actually acting on that thought and that desire breaks fellowship with our holy God. What about the eighth commandment? Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Let's go ahead and put that one up there. That means anything... That is not funny, guys. Stealing is a sin. That is wrong in the eyes of God. And so it doesn't matter the size of the thing you stole. Oh, I just stole a crayon once when I was five, maybe. I don't remember stealing anything else. You stole. Remember what James says. He says in uh, James 2.10 that whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all. What about commandment number nine? Commandment number nine, it's getting a little bit more difficult. I'm not hearing it. You shall not bear false witness, okay? What does that mean? It basically means lying. Go ahead and come and put that one up. It basically means you shall not lie. There's no such thing to God as a white lie. No such thing as, um, well, I was, I was lying to help somebody. What do you expect me to do? You know, she asked me if that dress made her look fat. I didn't know what to do. Guys, don't go in that direction. There, there are other ways Let's just not even go there. Let's just not even go there. Lying, all lying is wrong. And so what is the 10th commandment? Thou shalt not covet, okay? Which basically means, well, that's not where the tape is. The tape's in the middle. Um, so, <laughs> thou, okay, thou shalt not covet. That basically means... You should not, it, what, try to, why don't you put it up here? Ah, uh, okay, well, um, you're not supposed to uh, envy, you know, look at somebody and say, I want what they have. There we go, okay. I want what they have. Now, each of these sins, each of these things are representative of the law of God and what God desires of us. 
to be holy. This is a visual representation. And what's, what's kind of interesting here is that, you know what, you guys can go ahead and have a seat. Thank you so much for your help. <clears throat> I was going to have him stay up here a little bit longer, but this is probably the best time to have him have a seat. So how do you stack up against these Ten Commandments? Have you ever stolen something? Have you ever hated somebody in your heart? Have you ever been so angry with someone that you call them a fool? Have you ever exalted anything or anyone above God? Have you ever failed to keep the Sabbath? Have you ever failed to honor your father and mother? How many of us could look at this one and be like, yeah, I'm, I'm guilty. Hey, you know what? This is actually representative of what's going on in our lives. The evidence of change in our lives is not... <clears throat> the evidence of change in our lives is not that we no longer sin because sometimes, you know, we turn to Christ and we put it up on the cross and we may do pretty well for a while. But then we kind of pick it up again. We pick up our sin. But... The evidence of change in our lives, that Christ has changed us, is not that we no longer sin, that we are without sin, but that we lay it down. We give it to Christ. We continue to put it up on the cross. It's the reason Jesus died. There's a difference between laying our sin down and entrusting it to Christ and laying down in our sin. See, on this side of the cross, our sin defines you. But on this side of the cross, condemnation can't find you. On this side of the cross, we are enemies of God and the ways that we live, because we're imperfect, they are an affront to a holy God. But on this side of the cross, we develop a habit of returning our sin to the cross. Sometimes we have to keep picking it back up again. And we have to turn it back over to the Lord. We have to keep orienting ourselves toward the cross because what does the cross mean for us in our daily lives are we still over here condemned by God God wants to destroy us or are we over here where we no longer have to pay the penalty for our sins because Jesus the Lord and God over all has paid our debt. He has paid that price. And so this morning, what will be your response to Jesus? Will you say with Thomas, with me, with other believers, you are my Lord and my God over all. If you do, that's going to change everything that you do. The call of Jesus is full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. And we didn't finish the passage from before John 5. You study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. 
yet it's these that testify about me, about Jesus. Yet you refuse to come to me and have life. There's a, there's a well-known passage from a book called Mere Christianity written by C.S. Lewis. He began his life and lived much of his life as an atheist opposed to God. And listen to what he says here. I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him, Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on a level with the man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. So as you sit here this morning, examine where you are. Is Jesus to you Lord and God over all? Or is he a lunatic? These are our only options. And so as the worship team comes forward to lead us in a song of invitation, I pray that you will be doing work in your heart. Has the Spirit of God spoke to you this morning through the, wor uh, through the worship, through the reading of the word, through something that was said here? Trust that it is the Spirit of God. It is not me. It is not anyone up here. We are merely servants of God because we know what God gave to serve us. He became the servant of all to become the savior of all. So if you uh, have never committed your life to Christ, I encourage you to do that today. You don't know what the future is going to hold. Maybe you want to uh, join a church where you can grow in understanding of these things. Maybe you're not ready to move forward yet, but you just want to learn more. <laughs> we are all in that boat. No matter how much we know about Christ or about Scripture, we are all in that process of learning and growing. So join us with it. Maybe you just need prayer. Come forward for prayer. I would love to pray for you. We're opening up this area. If you want to come and kneel before the Lord and pray, then do it. And will you please stand with me?